I love it. They're for, me too. There for a minute, I forgot it was my turn to get up. We could probably stay here all day and just hang out with Sue and her singers and the band, right? Yeah. I love it. We are so blessed in so many ways. Um, how many of you guys are reading this book, The Fifth Agreement? All right. A lot of you. That's nice. We're studying that right now. And we are in the ninth chapter of the book. And um, it's about the victims. That's what it's titled, The Victims. Ooh. <laughs> that was good, whoever did that. Um, but for those of you who are not reading the book, and maybe it's your first time here, or you haven't joined us yet for the, for the series, let's go through the steps. What's the, what's the first step? Be impeccable with your word. Be impeccable with your word. That means a lot of different things. But most especially, I think, what it means for me is to mean what it is that I say and to say what it is that I mean. You know, I can find myself saying things I don't really mean. Um, to be mean, I hate to say that. But, you know, I can say things I don't really mean to be... A, sarcastic, be a smarty pants, because I'm very sarcastic. Again, one of my qualities. And uh, so it's about meaning what I say. It's about being certain that I am being clear with you about what it is that I mean and, and what it is that I need and what I want and what I want for you and how I feel things are to be as impeccable with my word as I can, and most importantly, to not use those words, and we know how powerful the word is, right? Not to use those words to harm anyone for any reason. And when I get afraid and scared, I can lash out, say things that I wish I didn't say. So being impeccable with our word, it sounds really simple, but it can be tricky, and we have to pay attention to what it is we say. What's the second one? <laughs> Don't take anything personally. I mean, seriously. Since every single thing we hear gets filtered through only the information we're hanging on to, how do you not take something personally? We filter it personally. But I think what the secret to that one is for me is to realize that when someone is saying something to me, they are also filtering it through their filters, and they're actually giving me more of an insight about them than they are about anything to do with me. So I think that's the trick for me, is to remember that it's not really about me. It's about them. And that's not so easy to do either, right? Especially if somebody, you know, hits something that you think might be a little true. Ouch. Then I get scared and I want to defend myself. But it's only because there's a little bit of truth there for me too. Anybody getting that? Okay. <laughs> Just checking. What's the third? Don't make assumptions. You guys are good. You are really reading the book. I like that. Don't make assumptions. Well, forget that one. I don't even know. I don't even know. The, the best I can do is to pay attention to the assumptions I make. <laughs> right? I mean, seriously, this morning was such a weird day. <laughs> Today was such a, this morning was so strange. I was so kind of out there. Somebody told me Mercury is in retrograde, which means nothing to me, but I'm using it as the excuse for my morning. <laughs> so everybody's in the kitchen. Everybody's in the kitchen this morning and they're doing all their thing. And I love the kitchen on Sunday mornings. Everybody's busy doing their thing and they, they know exactly what's theirs to do. And they're 
chopping and they're cutting and they're just, it's wonderful. If you, if you ever get a chance to come early, come hang out in the kitchen. They're going to be not happy I said that. But come hang out in the kitchen. No, so there's lots of people in there and I'm walking in there to get my water. And I come in the, the door, head toward the refrigerator, and I hear Dorothy and Gustavo, and they said something about, uh, oh, yeah, it was about four or five. Oh, yeah, that's when I got it, too. And that's really all I heard. Gustavo, it's about four or five. And, oh, yeah, that's what I got, too. Well, all of a sudden, the story I told myself about that was that they had some great spiritual insight at four this morning. And I wanted in on it. <laughs> it had nothing to do with that. We were talking about a whole other day at 4 or 5 in the afternoon. It had absolutely nothing to do with that. But I was certain. So, see, I mean, I didn't think, oh, here, right now I'm going to make an assumption. It happens without, it happens as naturally for me as breathing. I made an assumption about one sentence that I heard. Okay, so we laughed and giggled about that, and somebody told me, don't make assumptions. Yeah, okay, whatever. So I come over, I come over the refrigerator, and I have not figured out this new refrigerator. We were gifted this wonderful refrigerator that I cannot figure out. It doesn't matter how close I put my glass in the ice dispenser, it still goes all over the floor. And then I push the water, and it drips down the front of the refrigerator 100% of the time. And I try it different ways every time, but I can't get it. So anyway, I'm thinking, oh, what a mess am I making. In the meantime, I hear Don say something about following after or cleaning up. <laughs> Guess what I thought he was talking about? I just knew he was talking about me. And then I was like, oh you know, I'm not the only one that notices that I can't work the refrigerator, you know, and I was all, all of, you know, dither. It had nothing to do with me. Absolutely nothing. They did, didn't even notice I was in the room for the most part, but I had to grab something, clean up real quick and, you know, start feeling guilty. So this whole not making assumptions thing, the best I can do is to actually notice when I'm doing it. Okay. What's the fifth one? Oh, fourth one. What's the fourth one? Always try to do your best. I love that one. I really do like to do my best. I do. Um, but I'm a little ADD, and so a lot of times I'm doing things while I'm thinking something else. So, again, it's that thing about awareness, bringing myself into the now moment, being where my feet are is a good practice for me. Um, Reverend Sidney Alice Anderson, she has me doing this a lot to ground myself so that I remember that I'm right here, yeah, or pat my legs. So if you guys see me do that in the front row, it's because I'm trying to ground myself a little bit. Um, yeah. What's the fifth one? Ah, that's a tricky one, right? Be skeptical, but learn to listen. That's a whole brand new one, right? Be skeptical, but learn to listen. I think I was born skeptical. Well, no. I, I know I wasn't born skeptical, but I was raised skeptical. I was raised in a family that believed in lack, primarily. Um, Irish Catholic. And, uh, <laughs> you know, so we were skeptical about a lot of things, like, I, I told the earlier service that my, my big college advice that I got from my family was when I said, uh, you know, told them I wanted to go to college, the advice I got was, why would you want to go to college? And that was it. Got no, none other. So very skeptical. Um, it was just the way we were raised. You know, there wasn't enough. We had lots of kids. We had lots of family. Um, you had to work really, really hard. My parents worked really hard. Um, they were, there was a lot of sadness and a lot of anger and a lot of skepticism. I grew up very skeptical. But the interesting thing is, is that everything everybody told me about myself is exactly what I believed. And it became my belief system. I was too fat, too ugly. 
wanted too many things. You know, and that became my belief system. That's how we do grow. That's an interesting thing if you think about it, because that is how we do grow up. Um, we take on the religion of our families. We take on the food of our culture. We take on the habits and behaviors of the people who raise us. So it's interesting to say that one could be right and one could be wrong when really it's a matter of just where we were born and who we were born to that makes us any different. So why would we think one was any better than the other or one was right and one was wrong? But we have spent all of mankind time arguing about that, haven't we? It's fascinating. So I've got the skeptical part. Do you learn to listen? I'm still working on that one. And I got a perfect example. This book, <laughs> this book came out a few years ago, right? First time I heard about it, I had already been studying the fourth, the four agreements. We had done it here for fall faith. And I had uh, studied it with some friends of mine at home. And I loved them. I mean, they're wonderful steps. And they are simple, quick things that I could get a hold of to remind myself to be centered and be to approach everything in my life with love, which is really the answer, isn't it? It's the answer to being in that Christ moment at any time is to approach everything with love. So they were quick and they were easy and I would quote them, don't take anything personally. And, you know, I'm sure it was annoying to people, but just as the charm of that book started to wear off and I quit quoting it, this book came out. And what I heard, I hadn't actually seen it, but what I heard in my passings by was that the son wrote it. And it's the fifth agreement. Now, this is what I did. And this is going to give you like an insight to the woman behind the curtain. Don't be frightened. Um, this is exactly what I thought. And I didn't even realize I thought that until I started reading this book. And then I remembered that this is exactly what I thought. In a nanosecond, I said to myself, self, the father must have passed, and the son is trying to make a buck on the dad's coattails. That is not pretty. <laughs> but it is as honest with you as I can be. And then I never gave that book another thought. Not for a second did I give that book another thought. Now, I didn't go about spewing bad things about it. I didn't put out negative energy about it. I didn't talk badly about it. But boy, I tell you, I had a... I had an opinion based on absolutely nothing, and I stuck with it for years until RCA tells us we're going to study the book. Oh, okay. Then I find out, oh, no, you know, the father has not passed. I had the man dead and buried. No, uh, Don Miguel and... Don Jose Ruiz, they wrote it together. They collaborated together. And, you know, another thing that I thought of in that nanosecond of deciding the book wasn't worth it paying any attention to was that four agreements were enough. <laughs> yeah, so, and there really is a good fifth agreement, and that is to be skeptical but learn <laughs> to listen. You know, it's, it's, it's good not to believe everything that you hear. It's a really good thing not to believe everything that you hear. But you need to be open to receive new ideas and new information. It's like Jesus uh, in the Beatitudes, he tells us, Blessed are they who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Where's the kingdom of heaven? Yeah. 
Heaven and hell are states of consciousness, right? They're not places that we wait to go to after we die. They're states of consciousness within us. When we can be open to receive, we can experience the kingdom of heaven. But see, what happened was I decided without even, I didn't even exert any energy toward deciding the book was no good. And then I missed out on knowing that information for a few years until, you know, my soul knew I needed to be there eventually, and I got there anyway. But in the meantime, I got to lose out on a few years of not reading the book. How fascinating is that? And it's about really being aware of what we're thinking, what we're doing, why we're doing it, really being where your feet are. Um, I want to make a commitment this week to really pay attention to why I'm doing the things I'm doing. Okay, I'm, let me give you a little, little bit. Let me go back a minute. Um, I have decided, well, and actually, the authors of the book agree with me, that the majority of the things that we do that separate us from God are based on our fear. Oh, I love what, he, what they say about... Um, they say about... Uh, walking around victims of our beliefs. They call that hell. Now, I like that, right? Victims of our beliefs. So I believe that Don is complaining about the fact that I make a mess every time I go to the refrigerator. Now, I can take that silly idea and I can really run with it. I can decide that he's the executive director, so he's probably talked to RCA about this already. And they're probably going to put me on notice because I can't seem to clean up after myself. And, I mean, and you see what I'm saying? I can run with something. I can turn it into insanity before I even get back out of the kitchen. And what happens is that burns in my stomach. There's a fire there, like that's the fire and brimstone, that anxiety, that fear, that's hell. I love what they say. They say that's hell and fear is the king of hell. Yowza. So how much of your life are you spending driven by fear? How many things do you do in your week? based on fear? How many thoughts do you have based on being afraid of something? That's what I want us to pay attention to this week. Pay attention to what it is you're thinking about, why you're thinking it. Is there fear attached to it in any way? And you know how you know if there's fear attached to it? If you're not feeling good, there's fear attached to it. It doesn't matter if, it, if you're not feeling good because you're anxious or you're angry or it doesn't matter what the reason is. If you get honest with yourself and get quiet for just a minute, you can back into why you're afraid of something. And most of the time for me, it's I'm afraid that I'm not good enough. That's my thing. You know, I, ha I get to follow Reverend Cynthia Alice Anderson on the platform. How much fun do you think that can be? <laughs> no, honestly, she's been such a blessing in my life, and she is such an inspiration for anyone who wants to uh, be a healer. Amen. Yeah. But, but my, my, my biggest fear in the world, my, what I have called in my lifetime my worst nightmare, is actually getting up here and doing exactly what I'm doing at this moment. So, of course, my soul puts me right here, right in the middle of it with her as the best gift in my life to teach me how to do this to the best of my ability. But I had to be available. I had to decide that 
yes was going to be my answer. I had to get past the fear. I had to get past the fear of getting up this morning and coming and doing this. Everything we do, every single day, we need to pay attention to why we're doing it, what's motivating it, and what is it we're telling ourselves. Because it's not so much, I mean, we get a lot of information that is just crazy. We get told what to look like. We get told what to drive. We get told what to eat. We get told what to buy. But the scariest information we get is what we tell ourselves every day, all day long. Because we're smart. We can sort out what we hear. But we believe what we tell ourselves. And that's where we need to stop. So this week, homework. Now next week, I know it's kind of doom and gloom. Didn't that sound a little, but anyway, next week, RCA gives us a solution. But we're not going to get too much into that today because that's her gig. This week, we are going to seriously take a look at what it is that we tell ourselves all week long. Anything that you think you can't do, why do you think you can't do it? What is it you're telling yourself about it? Any time that you get sad, why are you sad? Are you afraid you're not going to have something? You're going to lose something? You're going to miss something? Any time you get angry, well, why are you afraid? Why? Well, honestly, I'm usually afraid because I'm afraid I'm not going to get something that I want Somebody's going to take something away from me that I already have. Or somebody's going to figure out that I'm no good. That's it. And if I can recognize that, then I have the opportunity to tell myself something different. Once we understand what it is we're telling each other, the very next breath we take needs to be turning to God and giving gratitude. Because, you know, we are all perfect. I just actually figured this out. We are all perfect. It's not about being too fat, not attractive, not driving the right car. It's about the fact that we all have that beautiful God spark inside ourselves that is absolutely everything that we need in our lives. Right? Right? So that's the very next thing we do. We figure out what lie we're telling ourselves. Then we remind ourselves of the truth. And the truth is that we are all perfect and loved. 